invite you now to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 8. We're going to look at a familiar text and a familiar story from God's Word and perhaps a favorite of some of yours. I'm definitely going to make the focus what the text focuses on and what Matthew is trying to get across uh, through the story that is familiar where Jesus calms the storm. It's an incredible miracle event, but there is something I think in this text and very importantly in this text for our own faith to grow and to, and to be more like Jesus through understanding what is here. What is Matthew bringing a story and miracle account like this for right here in Matthew chapter 8? We're going to find out, and I hope it's a blessing to you. I'm retitling uh, this different than what's in your bulletin as Faith for a Storm. Faith for a Storm. J.C. Ryle is one of my favorite uh, dead men that I read. Uh, he's a kind of a latter Puritan, if you will. He lived 1816 to all the way up to 1900 that year. He's an Oxford graduate. He was 38 years in the pastorate in England, the Bishop of Liverpool, and known as the Iron Fist in a Velvet Glove because he could say really, really hard things in a way that people would listen. He just disarms you as the way he, by the way he says things. Well, listen to this paragraph that was written by J.C. Ryle. It says, let us mark well this lesson. If we are true Christians, we must stop expecting everything smooth in our journey to heaven. We must count it no strange thing if we have to endure sicknesses, losses, bereavements, and disappointments just like other men. Free pardon and full forgiveness, grace by the way and glory at the end, all this our Savior has promised to give. But he's never promised that we shall have no afflictions. He loves us too well to promise that. By affliction, he teaches us many precious lessons, which without it, we should never learn. We need affliction. The Lord is in the business of growing our faith. And growing our faith by not taking us around storms, but taking us through storms. And I don't know what storms you're going through or have gone through or will go through, but for all of us, we need to be reassured that Jesus Christ, our Lord, sees into our lives, knows right where we are, and is growing our faith through trials and through testing. And he does this very thing as a means of preparation, so we'll be able to face even harder things that are unanticipatable. Jesus' disciples get into a boat and they are nautical specialists, watermen, those who fished for a living and they're following Jesus thinking that they're going to travel six miles across the Sea of Galilee, which is ocean-like, going to the other side. But Suddenly, right in the middle, they find themselves in a life and death struggle. It went from serenity to hurricane force winds, and it's dramatic. But what's more dramatic than serenity to tumultuous storm event is the shift in the disciples' attitude from complete trust, peace with Christ, following him, to becoming accusers of Jesus. It's an attitude from following to accusing Christ where we could easily look at them and go, how dare they, but aren't we just like those disciples, especially when death is on the line, especially when there is loss in this life. It's easy to turn on Jesus Christ, the one whom we've committed to follow. God is moving us through these storms to test not just the quantity of our faith, whether we have it or not, but the quality of our faith, whether we are ready to face more and more. Faith is an incredible gift of God that's given to us. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, it's by grace through faith that we are saved. And it's the grace of God that we would believe, but it is through believing that we receive the grace of God. It's kind of an amazing mystery and puzzle in the Bible. Faith is a gift it's, but at the same time, it's something that we are exercising. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. There's a functional dynamic with faith. 
we're believing. And we are believers. Faith and belief is the same word in the Bible. But it's all by grace that we are saved. And so God mysteriously ties that together where faith is instrumental. And we're exercising faith to be saved, but we need to keep exercising and growing in our faith to grow and be more and more like Jesus. It's like a muscle. You have the muscle and you exercise it and you're in. But if you don't keep exercising that muscle, it atrophies. Ultimately, your saving faith you know, will never go away. But you want your faith and need your faith to be strong to embrace the storms ahead. We don't know what is coming around the corner. And we have to be careful to distinguish Christian faith from the world's faith. A lot of people will say, keep the faith. Or, catch this, believe in yourself. Believe in yourself and you can do anything. That's exercising faith in you. Faith in faith often. That's wrong. That's not anything at all. That's just the wind. That's not something that's going to get you through anything, trusting yourself. Faith is really only as good as its object. Our faith is in the Lord. We aim our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ And the bigger your vision is of Christ, the more you know about Jesus Christ and trust in him, the stronger your faith is, the stronger and more equipped you are as his disciple. We know from Matthew chapter 8 earlier on that Jesus has just held an all-night miracle healing of the whole city of Capernaum. They all showed up at the door. He's casting out demons, making people whole displaying his lordship, his power over everything, over health, over sickness, over death, over demons. It's heaven on earth. And now Jesus is calling the disciples to follow him and go to the other side. He's exhausted. He's drained. It was all evening, and then it was the next day, and evening is coming again. He's saying, let's go to the other side. Let's get away to, from this population. Capernaum was filled with people. The west side of the Sea of Galilee was packed with with city and town life, and he wanted to go six miles across down to the southeast portion to the area of the Gadarenes, which was desolate and unpopulated, to get some rest. Now, we'll learn that where they eventually land is right at the tombs where two demoniacs are going to come out, legion filled with demons. Um, So ministry will keep going, even if... Jesus wasn't anticipating that as the next test in his journey. But faith here looks like following Jesus and getting into the boat. Verse 18 of chapter 8. Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. So a disciple is someone who's saying, listen, I'm willing to go. And remember, this is right on the heels of those hard cost of discipleship statements. Foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Hey, leave the dead to bury the dead. Leave the deadness of this world. Leave the security of houses and things and stuff. Get into a boat. That's what discipleship looked like at this moment. Self-denial. Follow Jesus and his leadership. Saving faith is strong and wants to follow Jesus. It's like a chemical compound that when the heat is applied, the elemental structure will never break down. Saving faith is like the faith of Job who, when tested, he struggled. He looked like he was at breaking points where he would ultimately deny the faith and deny the Lord, but ultimately nothing could destroy his saving faith. Nothing could break him all the way down. Saving faith is a faith that will be growing faith. That's why the test comes. That's why the storms come, so that we can grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and prove that we are kept in the beloved, that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ, that we are predestined by the Lord, that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit, that we are kept in all these Bible promises. We are inheritors. We are joint heirs, co-equal heirs in the body of Christ. And though the heat is on and the pressure is, is like a furnace, like First Peter talks about, where impurities are rising up and we're being exposed and it's like we're drowning in an ocean, we're still hanging on. We're still breathing spiritually because we have saving faith. Saving faith will be growing faith when you're tested We're held in the tight grip of the Father's 
hand, right? We are. Nothing can separate us. Amen? We need to hear this because the Lord is on our side, even smelted in the forgery of fire. We're going to live for Christ no matter what. This is growing faith. It, it's a faith that needs to keep growing so that we can withstand the storms that are coming, so we can withstand more. It comes through preparation. This is what the disciples were going to be challenged through this storm in, and it was a nautical challenge. Peter, James, and John, as uh, commercial fishermen, thought that they were just going to be able to go on autopilot or like a modern-day Tesla car that can just drive itself. They were just going to get in the water, do what they always have done, and navigate across six miles. Even if it was turbulent, they were used to it, but not this time, not this type of hyper-disaster. Let's learn what they learn in this encounter. And if you're taking notes, this is when, it's answering the question, when is faith deep enough to face a storm? You could personalize this. When will your faith be deep enough to face the storm that's coming? When is it deep enough? Well, first of all, let me ask it this way. When, first of all, when Jesus is your leader, when Jesus is your leader, is it deep enough then? When you say, I'll follow you, well, that's what Jesus called for. He gave orders to go over to the other side, verse 18 says. Mark says it this way, let us, quoting Jesus, let us go across to the other side, Mark 4, 35. Let's navigate this. Jesus was very busy in ministry. We just talked about his miracle ministry. He also had a a robust teaching ministry where he's always pouring out. He had gotten into a boat and been pushed out to where the water was like an amphitheater and he had preached the word of God to the masses. He had done that. Um, and now he was saying, let's get back into the boat. Let's go further and travel on. This was heavy lifting ministry where all the disciples wanted and I think all Jesus wanted was a predictable moment moving forward in the water. Jesus, in one sense, was falling asleep in the back of the car on the road trip. Mark 4.36 says that it was a little bit more than that, quite a bit more than that, because Mark 4.36 says they, the disciples, took him with them in the boat just as he was. That phrase is very unique out of Mark's gospel because it's the idea that Jesus gave the order to get on the boat and then basically fell virtually unconscious. Luke's gospel says that when they started out to sea, he fell asleep. But he was going into a semi-sleep mode and shutdown mode at that point because they were carrying him and literally loaded him on the boat. Other boats were the escort. He was loaded into the, into the back of the boat, the stern of the boat. And it says in Luke's account that he pillowed his head there. And so Jesus was nearly incapacitated from the fatigue from what he had gone through. Well, is this, let me ask this question. If you follow this Jesus as your leader, is this enough to satisfy where Christ wants you to be? Are you prepared for life's trials and as strong as you need to be? Following Jesus as leader, and then secondly, verse 24 says, um, uh, brings up the point, following Jesus as your intercessor. First, leader. Second, your intercessor, verse 24. And when, and behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being filled, being swamped by the waves. But he was asleep. But he was asleep. There's a great contrast that's built here by Matthew. Tumultuous waters, storm-like events, a hurricane force, wind, the word seismos is used here. It's like there was a sea quake that took place. It was natural events that were charged supernaturally to create this event. The, the water that they were navigating was six miles across and 13 miles deep, 700, 700, and feet, uh, 700 feet below sea, sea level, surrounded by mountains that were reaching um, heights of 9,000 feet. Mount Hermon was there, so great thermals would come off the mountain and go into this deep basin, and suddenly it would mix up with great turbulence. But this was turbulence that these fishermen were used to. 
But this level was fierce, so fierce that it says in verse 24 that this mega storm, this great storm, this sea quake on the sea was one where the waves were engulfing or swamping the boat. The boat was swamped by the waves. It means that one wave was crashing on the other. Growing up and even um, something I do today as a hobby when I get outside is I like to go surfing. Uh, There are times where I'll fall into the water, and that's often, but fall into the water and suddenly find myself in a rip current and one wave is hitting you and you come up for air and then another wave hits you and water goes in and it's, it's very turbulent. And all you can do at that point is settle down. If you ramp up, you'll get into trouble, but you just really need to let the ocean do its thing and let it subside. But in this case, what's happening is waves are crashing onto the boat and it's not subsiding. They are fighting for their lives, believing that they are going to die. And they have someone inside this boat who they believe could save them, but was fast asleep. That is the great contrast. You got storm weather and Jesus asleep all at the same time. Again, mentioning surfing, I grew up and have seen some pretty hairy things um, just in different events Um, But one stands out to me when I was 16, I uh, would go surfing on Saturdays and my friends, we would pack the boards up and go and, and we showed up and it was a serene, sunny, probably July, August day, 75, 80 degrees. And the water was almost too tame to even surf in. You would try to catch, you know, the waves before a hurricane would come or afterwards to really get big stuff. But this is just one of those serene days where it's almost like, should we even go out or not? And we were just basically standing out in waist deep water, catching little ripples and messing around. But suddenly we looked out on the horizon and it was placid. It was just completely still. But we saw boats in the horizon, fishing boats screaming in. We had never seen this before. And the fishing boats were going right into the inlet jetty right next to us, which is where we would surf because the waves would break there. And it's just one boat after the other just screaming in. And you look out on the horizon and suddenly everything went from sunny to complete pitch black darkness. And this dark Wizard of Oz like cloud is coming down onto us. Well, what's our reaction? Well, great, cool. The waves are going to get bigger right? So we stay in the water and, um, you know, it's thunder, lightning, and you're wanting to mess around, but it was really, really tumultuous. And it must've been really bad because we got out as young kids and said, this is no fun anymore. We stood on the beach and we were using our surfboards as shields because the sand was whipping in our eyes and it began to edge us across the beach and the boards flipped out of our hands, many of us, And they were like kites in the air because we were tethered. They were tethered to our ankles. We had to dive on them. And I lifted my board up, which I loved my surfboard, but it was used as a shield. And it it drove me across the beach and threw me up in the air over a dune on the other side. I remember hitting some plank wood on the other side. It was dramatic out there. And so we looked behind us. We said, we need to get out of here. And it was beginning to flood the roads. And, you know, it would be bad for our cars um, to even be able to drive out. But we had to go underneath power lines that were going back and forth like this on each other, causing streams of sparks to go down in the flood water. So what do you do? You just, you run for it. So we ran and made it out. And the next day it was in the newspaper. It was talking about signs being knocked over. I guess that's just a little bit of a taste as to what it might be. I mean, there are fishermen in Alaska who've gone through horrible events and uh, could relate probably in a, a far clearer way than that. But it was dramatic. The boat was filling, verse, um, or Mark 4, 37 says. It was filling up. Waves were beating it down. And Jesus is asleep in the boat. He had been pulled, just pulled into there just as he was, virtually unconscious, meaning he had completely dropped and fallen asleep. I've fallen asleep before in the um, bow of a boat in the Prince William Sound and the rocking and rolling and all of that can put you to sleep. But this is a ridiculous contrast between the state Jesus was in and the state of life and death that these disciples were in. MacArthur said, just before we see one of Jesus' most awesome demonstrations of deity, we see a touching picture of his humanness. The Lord was bone weary, slept soundly, even in the tossing of the boat, the noise of the wind, the blowing water in his face. None of that uh, awakened him. He was soaked to the skin, lying on hard planks with a cushion for his head. 
He was knocked out. This is full humanity. Kent Hughes said this is the grand display of opposites. The world is rocking and rolling. The storm is raging. The disciples are panicked. And Jesus is asleep. Can you relate? Can you put yourself there for a second and say, wow, how would I be? What would my behavior be like? Jesus is our sympathetic high priest. Jesus is fully human. He's a leader who says, let's get into the boat where things are going to get very hairy very quickly. He's our intercessor who's right there, even though it seems like he's asleep, fully human, experiencing everything in full humanity. He's our incarnate intercessor. You can believe that he's your leader. You can believe that he's your intercessor. But is that enough? Does that take your faith, watch this, deep enough to face a storm? Well, they, the disciples turn around quickly and they run back there. And they go to their faithful Messiah and wake him up. Look at verse 25. It says, And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, for we are perishing. This brings us to our third point. He's not only our leader and our intercessor, but he's our Lord. The word Lord is kurios, which means master. In Mark's gospel, the parallel account is where they call him uh, didaskale, which means teacher or rabbi. So basically, they're saying, save us, O master teacher, the one who is our mentor. In Luke's account, they call him chief. You're our chief. You're our coach. You're our coach. You're our leader. Uh, we're following you. And you're our teacher and our Lord. Save us. You'll know what to do in this situation. What did they do? They called out to Jesus, but in their panic, they began to sin against Jesus. They woke him up, and then they began to accuse him of not wanting to join their panic or not wanting to save them. Jesus has been exhausted, fatigued, casting out demons. All of that's explainable. But what is shocking, I think, is to see how they are accusing Jesus of things. In Mark's account, it's interesting. Mark chapter 4, if you'll look over there. It says in verse 38, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Do you not even care? They indict Jesus. Save us, Lord, quickly turned into a doubting session on Jesus. It's easy to get there, isn't it, when people die, when things happen to us that we don't understand. He cared to teach them, to guide them, but now they were saying, Jesus is going to let us all die. They were, in a word, incredulous at Christ. How dare you? Why aren't you at least joining in the panic? Why don't you even care? And I want to just throw this out there. In the Psalms over and over again, David says, where are you, God, right? This is a common heart cry where in the midst of suffering, in the midst of trials, it's easy to say, Jesus, I'm sure that you were just asleep. Is he? Well, I like what Kent Hughes says pastorally in this moment. He says, God knows every wave that falls on us. He knows the rate of our hearts while the waves fall, our respiration the innermost thoughts in our minds, our emotions, even our dreams. In actuality, listen to this, that tiny boat bearing Christ and his own was the object of the most minute heavenly attention and would have been even if it had sunk. J.C. Ryle said, what? Though our place be hard, what? Though our temptations be great, it is all nothing if Christ is on our side and we are in the ship with him. So he's our leader, is that enough? He's our intercessor, he's just like us, our high priest, fully human, is that enough? He's our master, he's our teacher. Is that enough in our lives for our faith to be strong enough to where God really wants you to be, to face what's next around the corner? He strengthens us through trials. And the next phase and next declaration these disciples make is that 
Jesus is God. What about when Jesus is our God? Look at verse 26. It says, And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Stop there. Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? It would be an understatement to to say that Jesus now had their attention. He totally had their attention. He's addressing them with a question so that they will not look to him, but look to themselves and, and examine themselves. Why are you afraid? The word fear here is different than the word Mark is going to use. Jesus is going to ask a second, subsequent question after he calms everything down. He starts by saying, why are you being cowardly? That's the word that's used here for afraid. Not phobos, which is just to be terrified, like I'm afraid of uh, something, you know, in a, in a fleshly way. This is more of an attitude. Why are you taking this attitude with me? Why are you acting passive aggressive with me, trying to provoke me? Why are you trying to get me to act by provocation? Why are you doing that? Examine yourself. Where is your faith at this point? Is it deep enough? What is the quality of your faith? Why are you doing this? It's where we can come to be in trials and things that we do not understand, where we are incredulous and need to be examining our cowardice behavior. Why are you acting this way? They were acting in a way that was wrong towards Jesus. Why are, they're going, why aren't you at least upset too, Jesus? They did have every reason to be afraid physically. Their lives were on the line, but they were missing the bigger picture of who was in the boat. They were acting fear-based and faithless. They had little faith. Jesus wasn't saying they had no faith, but he's saying, why are you afraid? Why are you acting this way? Oh, you of little faith. Often our panic, our sins of worry, our doubts, where we crumble under things that we can't understand why that happened the way it did, it comes down to one thing. We won't look to Jesus as the object of our faith. We turn inward instead of turning upward. We're looking outward instead of turning our eyes upon Jesus, looking full in his wonderful face. The things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We'll look everywhere else but look to Jesus, right? It's where we sink. It's where the accusation comes. Well, let's look at the miracle. What did Jesus do? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm Mark says, he awoke and rebuked the wind and the sea and said, peace, be still. Literally, Jesus stood up and said, hush, and everything went placid. Everything went serene. The waves didn't even keep rocking and rolling. Wind stopped, waves stopped, and it was a mirror. Unbelievable. Just hush. Why did he do that? And I suppose that Jesus did that to demonstrate his power over creation. But again, his chief concern is the hearts of these disciples. And I believe that Jesus was basically doing this where he was saying to the disciples, everything is serene. They're going to be looking out, out like this at the water. And guess what they're going to be seeing? They're going to be seeing a mirror reflection back of themselves where they've been going crazy. And suddenly they see themselves. What would it be like if we were video recorded in our worst moment? What is it like where if you're acting out, not in faith, and you look over and see yourself in the mirror? That's what Jesus was doing in this moment. He was showing them their sin, turning chaos into serenity. It really was flipping the table, saying that you had nothing to worry about at all. Jesus was not conjuring power from his heavenly father though he could have he was not um, attributing this miracle to the holy spirit though god is one in three jesus is creator and he's demonstrating his lordship over all creation in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth genesis 1 1 john 1 3 which speaks of the logos the word of god which is christ it says all things were made through him 
Colossians 1.16, all things were created through Christ and for Christ. Christ instrumentally created, he spoke everything into existence and he holds all things together by his power, even down to the minutest of detail. The Lord is in control of everything. Psalm 107 speaks of how he commanded stormy winds and lifted up the waves of the sea. Verse 26, waves that mounted to heaven while seamen, their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered, verse 27, like drunken men and were at wit's end. They cried to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress He made the storm be still and the waves of the sea were hushed. A lot of times people will look at tragic disasters and say God had nothing to do with that. Well, it's a mystery in terms of how our sin-cursed world hurts people and how Satan is the God of this world and how tragedy strikes. But at the same time, the Lord is sovereign over it all. The Lord is never responsible for sin but he does hold everything together. Verse 30, it's in Psalm 107. They were glad that the waters were quiet and he brought them to their desired haven. Jesus causes a storm. He brings the storm about in our lives. But he also brings us home through the storm. And that's what, that's what the hope of that psalm is. That's what sort of predicted this moment for the disciples. Jesus is Lord over creation. He, Psalm 89, 9, rules the raging sea. Listen to what Hendrickson said. He says about this, what's striking is that not only did the winds quiet down, but the waves did too. Generally, if the winds had died down, waves would have continued to billow. This was instead a synchronized, sublime symphony of solemn silence, making the surface of the water like a mirror. So what's the point? I mean, Jesus is Lord over demons, Lord over devils, Lord over sickness, Lord over death, Lord over false teaching. His lordship's on display. Scholars love to say, well, this poetically means he's Lord over creation, so we got just a package deal. That's what you learn about Jesus Christ. Well, that's great, but what does that mean to you? What does it mean that he is Lord over everything? He's Lord over it all, or he's not Lord at all, right? What does it mean? It means that we need to dig deep and examine our own hearts and say, how am I doing in terms of my present storm and the storm that is yet to come? Am I seeing Jesus not only as a leader that I'm following, as an intercessor who understands, who's empathetic with me as being fully human, as my master teacher, someone who I'm submitting to and learning from, is that where my faith level needs to go? What about as God who controls the wind and the waves? I believe in the miracles too. Is that enough for me in my faith walk and my faith journey? Am I strong enough for what's around the corner? That's what a text like this should cause us to ask. That's what these disciples needed to ask in their own lives. In Luke 8.25, the parallel question that Jesus lays lays out is, where is the faith of you? literally in the original language, where is your faith? It's not saying that Jesus isn't saying to them they have no faith. It's more this question. Why in the crisis were you not exercising faith? We're either accusing Christ or we are clinging to Christ. And they had Christ in the boat. They accused him of doing wrong. Don Carson says it this way, Jesus gave a rebuke that's therefore not against the skepticism, their skepticism of his ability, nor against the fear that the disciples like others might drown. Rather, they failed to see that the one so obviously raised up by God to accomplish the messianic work could not possibly have died in a storm while that work remained undone. The disciples failed to see the bigger picture of what God was doing. He's Messiah. He had said, and it's directly quoted from Mark's Mark's account, let's get in the boat and go to the other side. We're going to the other side. And Messiah is in the boat. We need to have a heart check in our own lives to say, am I trusting this one whom I say is God? 
Is my faith strong enough? Is it deep enough? What about verse 27, this final way that we need to trust Jesus? What about when Jesus is your Savior? Is that enough? That's where he wants to bring us to, by the way. Read with me verse 27. It says, And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this that even winds and sea obey him? They marveled. They marveled. Marveling is not necessarily positive here. They were astounded. Mark's account is one where they said they were filled with great fear, phobos. They were afraid and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now, they believed in Jesus. They were working through the fact that he is God. They were watching him do the miracles. They knew he had an amazing gift and power. They're trying to reconcile what the Old Testament said about the new, and this is Jesus, and there's a bigger picture and a bigger plan that we're buying into, and we're following Jesus. But in the moment of crisis, they were trusting Jesus just enough to get mad at him for what he wouldn't do for them. Where are you in comparison to that? Jesus wants you to go all the way with him where you say, Yes, your leader. Yes, your empathetic intercessor. Yes, you are my Lord. Yes, you are my master. And yes, you are God, very God. And yes, you are my beloved Savior. And I'm your child. What does that even look like when the wheels fall off? Their faith was untargeted, underexercised, unfocused. It wasn't as strong as it needed to be. When tested, they fell down like children. It's not wrong to cry out for God for physical safety, but there is a right posture and a right attitude to do that therein that looks like strong faith. What does that look like? Well, it's the difference between being panicked and being poised. We're called to be like Jesus. Poised. Some have called Jesus imperturbable in his ministry unbothered by things, being a rock in the storm, being solid in the storm. These disciples, according to Mark's account, they're, they're freaking out in the boat because they're realizing that God is in the boat. What sort of person is this? What, are they gonna, what is he now going to do to me because of what I just said to him? This is our experience. How do we grow in faith? How do we get stronger so that when things get extremely tough and we can't solve something in our lives, we can't do anything about what's happened to us so that we're strong? Let me give you a suggestion. Seek Jesus now. Seek Jesus and prepare your heart now for something that's going to come down the road that'll be harder than right now. Seek him devotionally. Read the word of God. Pray the word of God to Jesus. Now, believing in the Lord is the first step. Being saved by faith. But let me just challenge you that growing in your faith takes work. It takes work. Sanctification is hard work. Discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. You say, I don't like to do that. Well, you'll have wanted to do it when you're in the storm. You'll wish you had. Seek the Lord. Open your Bibles in the week. This is not just a call to be better Bible study students. I'm saying seek God with your heart and pray to him. Write promises down and embrace them devotionally. Have a spiritual life with the Lord. Let this be a launching point in your week to do more time with him so that you'll be poised when... The slats come out in your life. You say, but what about when I can't find Jesus? It's like he's sleeping. Well, perhaps it's as if he is sleeping on you so that you'll dig deeper and pursue him harder. Doesn't mean he's not there. He's always conscious of every trial of everything that's coming. We just can't come to Jesus, watch this, and ask him to work on our terms. Let that sink in. That's what the disciples were doing. Save us, Lord, in the way we want you to. We know you can do something. 
They were shocked at how he did it and how dramatic it was. But they believed enough in Jesus to believe he could save them. That's why they were angry. They believed in him enough to be mad at him. But they wanted to put conditions on Jesus. And we can't do that. To be poised in the trial, to be poised in the boat, just takes faith, understanding that this God who is in the boat is our Savior. We need to move from, yes, I'll follow him. I'm making a decision to follow Christ. Yes, I believe he's empathetic, fully human. Yes, I believe he's master and Lord. Yes, I believe he is God. But is he your Savior that you're clinging to? And that's where Jesus wants us to be. Hebrews 10, 31 says it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. It's fearful when we have unconfessed sin in our lives. Repent of your sins. You say, I'm not growing. Repent of your sins. There's one reason you're not growing. It's sin. Deny yourself. Follow Jesus. Repent. Be clean by the blood of the Lamb and grow in grace. This is the grace of Faith, where we grow from one level of glory to the next as we behold the face of Jesus Christ as it shines brightly from the scripture. Repent and grow. There's an Old Testament parallel I'll finish with, and that is um, the story in the Old Testament paralleling Jonah with Jesus. In Matthew 12, 41, Jesus said himself, someone or something greater than Jonah is here. He meant himself. The story of Jonah in Jonah chapter 1 is one where Jonah was in the boat as a sinner, which perhaps is a little bit more relatable for us. Jonah was running from the will of God because he did not want to preach the good news of grace to Nineveh. Verse 4, it says, The Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. The mariners were afraid. Each cried out to their God. They hurled cargo out of the ship to lighten it. Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship, had lain down, and he was fast asleep. Does that sound familiar? So the captain came and said, what do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps God will give a thought to us so we won't perish. So they cast lots, verse 7, that they may know on whose account this evil had come. The lot fell to Jonah. They went to Jonah. They said, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What's your occupation? What do you do? Where are you from? And Jonah said, I'm a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Jonah was a believer. He was just in rebellion. What was wrong with Jonah? He was in sin. What's wrong with your spiritual life? You've got something to deal with, something to repent of. So Jonah needed to repent, but he did give credit um, for whom he was committed, which was the Lord of heaven. Verse 10, the men were exceedingly afraid and said, what is this that you have done? The men knew that he was fleeing for the presence of the Lord. So they were getting insight that this is the true God. Because he had told him that, and they said to him, what shall we do that the sea may quiet down? And the sea grew more and more tempestuous. Verse 12, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. That was terrifying for these sailors because they're going, if we commit capital murder, we're already in hot water. We're going to die. We can't kill Jonah. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard. So they said, we're not going to take salvation by a sacrifice we're going to work harder to 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 make ourselves okay tried to get back to dry land but they could not and the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them therefore they called out to the lord oh lord let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood for you O lord have done as it pleased you so they picked up jonah hurled him into the sea and the sea the sea ceased from its raging Verse 15, God always demands a sacrifice. It's always been that way as the Old Testament accounts, but there was one ultimate sacrifice. One way to solve the storm, not on the outside, but the storm that's raging on the inside in your own heart. And that's with the Savior, the greater Jonah. We have to see the greater Jonah who threw himself, who hurled himself into the abyss of this world, into This world of sin so that he could solve and give you grace. Solve your sin problem and give you grace. Absorb the wrath of the Father into himself on your behalf so that you could be saved by grace. 
I was challenged theologically this week in a meeting I had regarding the atonement and whether it was for everyone. Well, the general call is for the whole world to believe, to see the greater Jonah, to be like Nineveh and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. But that atonement is particularly applied to everyone who believes, and that's the church. Jesus died to save you from your sin, to solve your inner storm, so that you'll be able to grow in grace and continue to embrace Jesus Christ in a way that will prepare you for the greater storms that will come. Be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the one that knows you and loves you. Cry out to him in your storm. Do it, but do it by faith as you stand on the rock of Jesus.